Welcome to the Dev Radio Podcast. On today's episode of the Dev Radio Podcast, I have Igor Portugal joining me. Thanks for joining me, Igor. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. It, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, I'll let you take over your introductions because there's no way I'll do it justice. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I've been uh, a serial tech entrepreneur in New Zealand for the last uh, nearly 30 years. I've started my first IT business in 1998. Uh, and then I had a, a couple of successful exits, um, successful by New Zealand standards. I wouldn't call myself successful by Silicon Valley standards anywhere, anywhere near, but uh, good enough. Uh, I'm pretty happy. Uh, and uh, after a, a short stint at a corporate career, I'm back at uh, building startups. And uh, the uh, experience and the, the grey hairs help a lot. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure they do the experience the gray hairs have come from the experience not the other way around hell yes yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so before we drive into your sort of startup entrepreneurial journey where did you branch out to when you went to that corporate period so what was um, what did you move to so it's interesting um my background is uh, I am a software developer I've been trained software developer by background and before I started on my uh, entrepreneurial journey uh, I used to be a, a software developer, started out as a, an employee, then I was fortunate enough to fall into a contracting um, space. So I kind of learned what it is to run your own kind of show when you're a contractor, you're almost a one-man band business. Uh, and um, I ended up helping some of my friends with their business startups and doing some of their develop, developers for, development for them. Uh, on, on, on a contract. Uh, and then as I started in, uh, in my own business and my own startup land, and I've been running startups for about uh, um, 50, uh, 50, nearly 20 years, I started running business about ne nearly 20 years. Once I sold my last, did my last big exit, I thought, well, um, uh, I'm, I'm in my 40s, I better go and find a real job, um, otherwise no, I'm never going to get employed um, anymore. And, um, and I was thinking about what am I passionate about, right? I was thinking about, you know, I've done everything. As a startup entrepreneur, you're like, CEO is, stands for Chief Everything Officer. Uh, and, and, and by everything, we mean everything that nobody else wants to do. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. If you don't have money to pay someone to do something, you do it. <laughs> that's that's. Yeah, exactly. You learn. <laughs> you learn. You learn. So, uh, you know, coming out of twenty years of doing everything that nobody else wants to do, you kind of think, okay, um, what is it that I enjoy doing? And what I realize I enjoy doing is I re enjoy uh, people contact. Uh, I enjoy sales. So I went into a corporate sales career. Um, I spent about four years uh, uh, running sales and marketing for a company called Catalyst Cloud here in New Zealand, uh, a very ambitious mm -hmm. cloud provider taking on AWS and Microsoft in their own game with local data centers here in New Zealand. Uh, then I did some work with a company called the OneNet, uh, and then some, somehow I fell into uh, the other side of the fence from being sales to uh, being chief digital officer for a, a food manufacturer before realizing actually my heart's in the startup and entrepreneurial land, which is where I'm back at right now. Yeah. So the skills yeah, you learned early on would have definitely helped you there, and then you Absolutely. would have learned probably something different at that level. Yeah. Because you're probably dealing in larger contracts, bigger things, longer buying cycle, and then how to map that back into when you made that pivot back, I'm guessing. Um, yes and no. Uh, the, my last... Uh, business that I've had, Vardacom, uh, we've had some substantial uh, organizations that we were servicing. Um, so I was already familiar with the longer buying cycle and uh, selling into that larger uh, corporate. Um, I wasn't doing it myself. I was doing it with the help of some very experienced salespeople. So le learning how to do it myself, I guess, was very valuable for me. Uh, and not only learning how to do it myself, I was uh, very fortunate uh, to be coached by one of the best salespeople in New Zealand, who uh, unfortunately is now retired from everything uh, and uh, isn't coaching anybody anymore. So I'm trying to pick that uh, uh, 
I picked that skill up myself. Uh, but um, uh, I've, uh, I've filled in a lot of the gaps in my understanding of uh, uh, sales process and sales strategy for this B2B technology sales um, from what I've had experienced over the last 20 years before that. Okay. So we can probably do an episode on each one of your startups. Absolutely. Is my guess. Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. How could you give us an overview of sort of the different spectrums or what you've done over the years in that journey? And then we can go into some key learnings after that. At least give us some background to start with. Well, there's a lot of they 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 all have uh, their own uh, story uh, in their own right. You're absolutely right. Could do an episode on, uh, on each, and they all had a, a, a very interesting journey. Uh, my my very first foray uh, into business. Um, uh, you know, I've, uh, I always often ask people how much they spend for the education. Uh, you know how it's an interesting question. Um, I spent twenty thousand dollar investment that gone poof to get educated and how not to run a business, <laughs> and and they weren't even my mistakes, right? So uh, um, so my very first um, foray into business was partnering up with another business that went spectacularly bust, uh, taking in some of the some of my cash, uh, but it taught me. Uh, what happens when it all goes to rubbish um, and uh, it showed me what to watch out for when you actually want to run a successful business and so the next one that I've built uh, was a lot more successful uh, I've had some other lessons uh, the the second most important lesson was choose your business partners carefully make sure that you are compatible uh, with your business partners it's a little bit like dating. Um, you've, uh, you know, the difference between uh, dating and business is, uh, uh, if, you, if you, when you're dating, then you get married, uh, then you know something happens and you divorce. You have to give half of everything that you built to someone else. Uh, in business, uh, unfortunately, divorces sometimes take everything. <coughs> Yeah, and then happen, some depending on how you structure things <laughs> and then yeah. some <laughs> yeah it, it can be a big problem depending if you don't it, have the right structure it, exactly in place. If, if, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about exactly the worst case scenario um, so yeah. uh, yet people are much more careful about choosing their uh, life partner than they are about choosing their business partner <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you don't normally go and ask someone to get married on the first date, and that's generally what happens with a lot of like clients trying to pick people they want to work with, or businesses yeah. get excited about an opportunity and straight away let's partner and move forward. But they get, yeah, there's not enough DD happening, yeah, and not enough just taking time. Absolutely, yeah, and that's that's exactly the problem. Uh, quite often, the problem. Sometimes people are lucky, but uh, more often than not, it ends up in tears. Yeah, it, it, it can. Yeah, I've heard some shocker stories. Mm. Mm. So, what sort of industry or area were you in? So, you've been in—is it tech startups mostly? So, I, 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 as a software developer by background, uh, I've been my entire life has been something to do with tech, um, something mm -hmm. to do with software. Uh, my first uh, successful business was New Zealand's first Linux specialist practice and uh, we were doing anything and everything as long as it's uh, revolved around open source technology mm -hmm. uh, from implementing uh, websites and building building web apps to people to building file servers email servers firewalls uh, we've built one of the very first uh, managed cybersecurity uh, practice building on top of Linux firewalls. Uh, so it was quite a wide ranging uh, business. Uh, and uh, once I've sold that, I went into building a my next successful startup, which was uh, Vardacom. Uh, and that is IP telephony business. Again, uh, okay. software, but, uh, but more with the telecommunications. Angle. And then I spent about 12 years 
in the um, uh, unified communications, telecommunications, voice over IP space. When we started, it was quite new and uh, quite revolutionary. Uh, by the time I sold the business, it was uh, pretty much every man and his dog doing this thing kind of thing. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, white box solutions you can just resell. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the sort of the key things you've taken away over that journey of those startups and the ones you haven't mentioned that sort of carry on with you today into what you're doing? Well, one of the uh, main key things in, in business is uh, uh, build a business that solves a real problem. Uh, and uh, I guess this isn't something that I have done, uh, but I've seen many startups do it. They um, uh, find the problem uh, to uh, create a solution, but the problem is not really a real problem. So the, a lot of startups end up with a solution that is beautifully built and they've just spent a lot of time building it. And then they go out into the world in search of that problem that they've imagined uh, in the yep. first instance. And then it ends up uh, not being a problem. Uh, and often, uh, you know, I have the the sizing test, and it's kind of important because it's also part of my sales strategy that I'm preaching now. Is that uh, there is a size of the problem that the customer has, and then there is a size of the solution. And the way it all often looks is that uh, you can solve this problem by spending ten bucks. Or you can get the solution that costs hundred dollars to implement, and then implement that to solve the ten dollar problems. That's not going to work. No, <laughs> you know, yeah. customers yeah, the, the, the are not scales are, just, scales are a bit unbalanced. Yeah, there. just because it's shiny and automated doesn't mean that it costs less to implement and run. And one of the biggest challenges that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs face is that um, they go into building something without realizing the true cost of implementing it and Mm -hmm. what is going to be then cost to the customer to implement. They don't figure out the entire cost. Where my approach to business now is I start with engaging with the customer Uh, engaging with target market and understanding the size of the problem that they need solved. And then I work backwards to find whether there is a solution uh, to be be made. Uh, And it's very important to calculate not just the cost to me or the cost plus, plus whatever profit that I want to make, but also the cost of change. Uh, that's one of the things that are that are very often misunderstood, and I've heard story, countless stories of salespeople complaining. Uh, they said, "Oh, it's a no-brainer. We went to them. You know, they've got a budget of a hundred thousand dollars, and we've shown them this beautiful eighty thousand dollar solution. It's like a complete no-brainer. Just do it." And then, if you dig deeper, you realize that well, actually. For them, the cost of change may be another 50,000. So your 80,000 solution plus 50,000 is going to be way more than the problem that you're solving. And the problem, and the, 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 the challenge is customers don't articulate that very well, right? So no. they will not tell you. They just tell you, we've got a $100,000 budget. And then you work to that budget, right? You don't think about, uh, well, this, when they say 100,000, they also mean some of the internal um, stuff. Um, as a chief digital officer, I was a, a part of scoping out a transformation uh, a project for, for the company. And uh, uh, the executive team has been looking at what's the cost of the transformation projects. They, they've been looking at the quotes provided by the suppliers to implement that. Uh, and then uh, what I ended up doing is I ended up going to the different department heads and saying, okay, well, if you're going to implement this, how much more staff do you need and for how long, right? And by the time I've calculated all that impact, uh, because if you're a manufacturer, you can't stop manufacturing just because you're implementing a new system, right? People still got to... Uh, gotta buy buy your yeah, stuff you transition unless period. unless you shut down your whole manufacturing for for a year, which nobody does, right? 
Um, yeah. So it's you a need to transition period which is, impacts exactly. And then by the time we calculated that, that was double the cost of what our suppliers was costing it, were, were, were quoting us, and uh, yep. you know we've scrutinised it and pared it down to eighty percent of the cost. But still, it's you know one point eight times what we were uh, quoted, which which ended up to be quite a significant uh, significant cost. And the challenge is that not many people actually do it. Uh, what they do do is they look at your cost, they scratch their head, they think, well, actually, uh, it's going to be a pain in the butt, so we're not going to do it. And by the, by the pain in the butt, what they really mean is that by the time they add the cost of change, it's going to blow out their budget. Yeah, so yeah, change management is always one of the most difficult things, not just the cost of change, but actually trying to upskill, train, and get Absolutely, people who are, yeah. are stuck in their ways to actually adjust what they're doing Absolutely. is one of the biggest challenges you're going to have. People don't like change. Everyone likes to be doing what's familiar to them yep. and not have to change. That's, I think that's a big problem with in the tech startups, probably more than anywhere else, because you're building software or you've built something that you know will solve a problem. Yep. But if you haven't factored in how that actually affects the user at the other end, then you're going to have a big problem. Because you can't just say, all right, management's going to say sign off on it and they're just going to push it through. Yeah. Because they're going to have problems. We had that, and that's how the whole reason of our DevReady brand started was we built a solution for a client. We thought we had asked all the, all the right questions. Mm -hmm. He told us he had spoken to all the right people, built a great solution. He went to roll it out at a trade show, and then the business, was an internal like, business trade show. Yep. And no one else from the business wanted to take it on. So it sat there. So we thought, all right, how do we then get beyond that? Because we don't want to build things that not let alone impact organizations. It's don't get used. Yep. And that, that's the worst thing you can do. And that's not you. You're, you're factoring in the cost of the solution versus the problem, what your total addressable market is. It's yep. understanding who you can affect, how, how's it going to benefit them, when are they going to get an ROI on that as well yep. is important, not just the cost. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I have the, the same experience of building something that doesn't get used. Um, so, you know, one of the... Uh, one of the things that we um, uh, did uh, early on in, uh, in, in the Vodacom days is we've built this uh, beautiful user interface, which I've designed called uh, Buddy, which was the beautiful, that there was going to be the future of telephony. And a lot of people would buy the system uh, just because of how well it looked and how user friendly it appeared. Mm -hmm. Right. And then uh, at some point I have employed i realized something was off like i didn't know what but i realized something was off i was not the best ux designer in the world so i yep. i've employed uh, a ux designer. I actually ended up importing because at the time nobody knew what ux even was was a new concept i ended up importing guys the guy from chile uh okay uh, and, and he actually went on to do great things here. He was a uh, head of uh, user experience for Zero for a while, eventually. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, and, and now I think he runs um, user experience at Atlassian. So quite a, uh, yeah. quite a very talented guy. And we sort of sat down with him and started reviewing the user experience. And, and he goes, well, let's just see how many of our customers actually use Buddy. To my shock horror, <laughs> I've discovered yeah. that the answer was almost none. <laughs> oh, well. They, they just used the integrated solutions and they, rather than the standalone version. No, they just, didn't, they just picked up the phone and talked. Like, they did not use... Oh, okay. <laughs> they, they, they did not use the, um, uh, the oh. user interface at all. Uh, there were a handful that did, uh, and that gave us... Yeah. But the, what that taught me is that, well, actually, contrary to what you just said, building something that sells but not necessarily is used is a kind of strategy because it was yep. give, like it's we, selling. We, it was selling. Yeah, it was selling. Yeah. Uh, but then don't kid yourself, right? You've got yep. to know what, 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 the, what the right thing to do. And uh, when you have a big enough market, and you've got something that sells, but it's not getting used. Uh, it's it is kind of important to turn it into something that's getting used because the problem is yep. that then people don't end up renewing and 
you know keep, yeah, keep the keeping up low, the retention's low, low, keeping up with the uh, with the buying cycle. But um, the point is just just because you can sell it doesn't mean it's useful. Don't kid yourself. Correct. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the best example that comes to mind of that that I can remember, yeah. which is probably dating my knowledge a bit, and you'd remember this as well, is uh, Microsoft Word moving from the traditional menus yeah. to that new ribbon interface. What was it, 10 years ago now? Word 2013, I think it was. Yeah. And the reason they did it was when they asked, but they polled their users, how many of these functions do you know exist or how to use them? And no one knew any of them. And they were getting new feature requests, I think, every week for functionality that was already in the product because people didn't know how to find it, didn't know how to surface it because the existing menu was crap. So that's a a scenario where you have the product sold, people are familiar with it, but then the big change management at their level, which is probably very unprecedented to get a change management process at that scope where you've rolled out a new interface that billions of people may be using. Yeah to try and solve problems that don't exist because the people don't know how to find things. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, yep. Yeah, I, 100%, and I totally agree with you. And that kind of taught me also the importance of user experience and, and building something that people will will eventually use. Uh, you know, sales is one thing, user experience is another. Yep. Yeah, you need people to use the product. It's just like if you're a carpenter or someone else, if you're building a piece of furniture or a house and so no one's going to use it, what's the point? Yeah. You feel like, yeah. all right, you've gotten paid for it, but it's it's like hollow. You you haven't achieved anything. Exactly. You actually want to help people. I, I think that problem of building something without a solution, from my mind, a lot of probably tech founders do that more than the non-tech founders. I think yeah. the non-tech founders may not ask the right questions, Yeah. but the tech founders, because they can code, can just jump into doing something very quickly. Oh, it's easy. I'll do it over a weekend, and they get a really quick prototype going, and now they've got a. Now they're looking to find a problem. Yeah, a, a, yeah. <laughs> find a problem that fits that solution that they've put together. <laughs> yeah, a solution. A solution. Looking for. Yes, and uh, I agree with you. And that's one of the challenges with uh, with a lot of uh, tech founders is is build. They 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 do tend to often build a uh, a solution in search of a problem, and then. The next step, of course, they go and look for funding. Uh, and one of the one of my favorite um, sort of don'ts uh, in funding is you know ninety nine percent of uh, 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 funding pitches that I've seen look something like that. Um, I've just quit my job, so I can do this really cool gadget that nobody wants to buy. So now I want you to pay my salary so I can keep working on it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> not a good pitch, is it? Well, it, when you boil it down, you know, ninety percent of startup pitches look at a, look something like that, right? Or, or I want to quit my job, right? Uh, you know, I build this gadget, yeah. nobody wants to to buy. And um, very often, when so I've built two businesses organically and and the startups that i'm founding now uh, i'm also mm-hmm. growing organically and very uh, and 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 what they call boots bootstrapping and very often when people come to me for advice on seeking investment or raising capital uh, my first uh, answer is well your best investors are your customers have you tried selling it uh, and uh, when the answer is, well, no, uh, then, okay, so you've built something nobody wants to buy and you want investors to buy it instead. What's in it for them, yep. right? Um, that's the brutal kind of response to it. Um, yep. th- there are a lot of nuanced, nuanced things like sometimes, oh, but, you know, in order for me to cover my development costs, I need to scale and I need to sell so many. Uh, so there are there there are nuances, but um, no matter how many sales that you need to make to have your business profitable, you can make them those sales. Uh, there are you know, for for consumer goods there are things like Kickstarter, for example, where you can do a crowdfunding campaign and basically sell what you don't have to a lot of customers. If it's a if it's a solution that has a problem. You can find enough clients. You can you can get people to come in and commit to buying your product 
if it's built and then find enough people that want to buy it but most uh, you know my, my area of expertise is the b2b larger sales and if you're doing a b2b solution for a um, a medium-sized or larger-sized customers, typically you only need a handful of clients in order to build your business viable. So go and lend one, go and lend two, three, and then you've got enough cash coming in to cover 60, 70, 80 uh, percent of, um, uh, of what you need to spend. Then the pitch to investors is kind of different. You, can, you come to them and say, I've got this business opportunity. Come and be my business partner, so you can make some extra money on your on on your cash. That and that's how a pitch for investment should look like, as opposed to, I need salary to pay for myself and some of my developers. <laughs> Come. Yeah, you, you're you're investable at that point because of you've course. got people who have committed to paying, which means. There isn't a market, there isn't appetite, we have growth. Absolutely. Where the other way is you're looking, you're getting money either, like you said, cover my salary so I can afford to do this. Yeah. And then we'll see and look and, and potentially we'll find a market. Yeah. Rather than, all right, I have tested. Here's the 20 different strategies I've tried. Here's the three messages that work. Here's the six customers that have agreed to pay. Like it doesn't even have to be big numbers as long as you of, can commit to get people to pay for something. Of course. Of course. You need to prove your and, market. And, yeah. Yeah, and we, we're doing that ourselves. So we're AI, AI boom now. We're building an AI-assisted consulting product. Yep. But it Amazing. started as it's it's solving my problem. So I'm building it for myself to make my job easier. And then eventually we're like, all right, there's other people like me. So then now, all right, this could be something that goes in the market. And we're just talking to people, getting feedback, and they're trying to actually sell it because while we've built a solution that's our problem, it is a common problem for everyone else, but it's our way of doing it. Well, that's very similar to um, uh, one of the companies I'm involved with, uh, which is Blacklock.io. Uh, it's a, um, mm -hmm. a cybersecurity product helping organizations with their penetration testing. And uh, it, it kind of came from the uh, from same roots. So Nilesh Kapoor, who is the founder uh, and CEO of, the, uh, of Blacklock, he was a pen tester himself. And initially... What he was doing is he was building an automation tool to automate all his admin stuff and all his menial things. Yep. And so eventually he automated all, all of the admin, all of the report writing, uh, and cr brought the workflow to, to what he's doing. And suddenly he ended up with a product that, that automates pen testers' job. Yep. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, we've been, he brought me uh, on board once, once he already got that uh, product ready. So we've over the last couple of years, we've been scaling it up, and it ends up being a pleasure and an and easy product to sell because you're selling something that was built to to to, fix, to solve a specific problem. Yeah, if you can solve your own problem, then you're on the right path rather than just building a cool idea and then trying to figure out what to do with it. Exactly. Because if you have a problem, there's going to be other people like you. You know the market, you understand the pain points, you know how to actually sell to it as well. Yeah. If that's where having that like domain experience related to the startup that you're actually taking on is really critical. It's very important, very important. But don't just solve your own problem because you think it is a problem. Uh, solve it if you've got revenue. So if you're solving your own problem to help you be more efficient, uh, do that when you need to be more efficient because there's a bigger market for you to address, right? If yeah, you, a good point. If, if, if you're... Uh, if you are, um, you know, a carpenter and you've got three clients for the for the things that you build, um, and and you're doing it manually and it takes up half of your day, just because you automate it and now you can do the same thing in in, in a couple of hours. Well, then what? If you don't have any more clients, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's going to help you scale, it your didn't actually business, help you scale. Yes. So, um, you know, one of the challenges there's a lot of um, there's a lot of conversations in New Zealand, for example, because. You know, let's face it, New Zealand is a very tiny market. Our whole, whole entire country, uh, our entire market is one suburb of uh, Sydney. Um, actually, no, Sydney. Uh, no, not one suburb, Sydney. O Auckland is like a suburb yep. of Sydney, but the whole of New Zealand is like Sydney, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and that's the entire market, right? So if you have built enough capability to service this entire market, 
uh, making yourself more efficient is not going to increase this market. You actually need to go and find a way to get ways to get other markets. And um, automation in the same market that you're in versus automation to scale up outside of your own jurisdiction, outside of your own geographical location, th these automations could be actually very, very different. And that's another thing that people need to realize. And that's one of the challenges. It's interesting. I see a lot of Australian companies coming into New Zealand uh, failing because they don't, they automate for bigger market inside Australia, but they don't deal very well with a smaller market here. Uh, even though we speak the same language and the market dynamics appear to be the same, but they're not because of the size. And same goes for New Zealand companies going into Australia. They need to um, accommodate for geographical dif distance, time zone differences, but also different way of do ways of doing business. A bigger market means different way of doing business. And then both New Zealand Australians, when we go to the US, that becomes, you know, another level, another challenge. Yeah, um, 50, 50 Australians there. Exactly. <laughs> you, each you, state's like a different country. Each state's like a like, a, like Australia. And um, yeah, that's how we feel coming from New Zealand to Australia as well. You know, for us, it's um, it's it's 10 New Zealand's, or five, New Ze five, yeah. five, size, five times the size of New Zealand. And each state is different, um, different market as well. So a lot of these things I've um, uh, I've managed with both of my uh, companies that, that, that were successful we managed to establish ourselves in Australia but never really managed to go any further than that uh, that was uh, getting uh, getting a bit difficult and uh, the advice we had is you know for us to go beyond Australia that's when you need investment that's where you, you need to yep. say okay well now you've proven this market and this market now to take it to the next level, next market, you actually need to spend some some money. And this is yep. where you go to investors and say, well, we've proven the product, we've proven the market, but we need now investment to scale outside. Yeah, and you've got revenues and then they can actually see a path to an exit for them of as course. well. Of course, yeah, of course. Because you can't, you, you shouldn't be trying to get investment or sell at the peak because there's nothing left for the next person. Yeah. You need to let them have room in a runway to be able to actually try and capitalize on their win, like their investment. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Except, um, you know, this is where technology businesses are better than um, uh, some of the uh, bricks and mortar one, because um, with tech businesses, there's never really a peak. There's very seldom a peak. Uh, and we've, we have this... Um, uh, we have this example of uh, in New Zealand, we have a company called Trade Me. Uh, which is uh, our equivalent of eBay. Uh, and TradeMe has managed to sew up this market pretty well. So there's no, there is no eBay in New Zealand uh, because there's TradeMe. Okay. Uh, and the guy who built TradeMe, he sold uh, that company for about $700 million and everyone thought this was a peak. And it's been sold twice or three times since then. Now it's valued in the billions mm -hmm. and it's still growing. Uh, it's um, yeah. So is it because it just capitalized the market? It's not. Well, it's captured, adding new features, adding new products. New it's ways completely of captured the market, and it's just adds. So they've added. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, there was just your general goods. They've added uh, motors. They've added real estate. They've pretty much okay. taken yeah. over the whole real estate market. Um, the the rental and sales they is that going into other verticals yeah they're going to, yeah and and yeah. Um, and they keep adding keep adding they now recently added jobs um, etc because such a big brand in New Zealand uh, mm -hmm. anything you wanna you wanna you need something you go to trade me first just you to see if it. anyone's selling that yeah yeah so and it keeps okay. growing so yeah it depends how you yeah, approach it so. The standard auction probably would have had a, a peak and a limit, and then yeah. they had to expand into the next vertical to be able to then grow the business and leave some more cash on the table for the next person to come in and milk. So, yeah, it, there is quite a lot of things to look at, whether you're starting a business, building a product, or trying to figure out how to get it to the next yeah. level. There's hundreds of things you can look at, and you won't know if you're making the right decision either as no. you're going through those things. It's just trying to 
like speak to yourself and learn from people like you or people who have gone through these journeys before to learn as many little things as possible. So then hopefully one of those nuggets is the right decision at that point in time. Absolutely. But building your your, absolutely. your like defenses up with the information yeah. is critical. Yeah, absolutely. So Igor, it, it's been a pleasure to chat to you today. We'll have to cut this short, <laughs> being weary of the time. Sure. Um, we can probably have to, we probably can do another episode at some other point, I think. We, we barely touched the surface of what you've been doing, but Sounds some good. key information came out of that. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch and learn more about you, how can they do that? So I have a uh, website called igorportugal.com uh, or they can send me an email, uh, igor.portugal at gmail.com uh, or even better, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I uh, usually accept invites from Australia and New Zealand. Um, so yep. yeah, hit, hit me up on LinkedIn and um, happy to talk business. Um, I've yeah, uh, happy always happy to share uh, what I've learned with people. And then yeah, check out um, Igor's got a series called Ninety Nine Coffees as well, where he interviews and people similar to this process and Absolutely. shares their story with with, the, with them. Um, and we'll add those all those links into the show notes as well. And once again, Igor, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Sounds good. Thank you, Anthony. It's been a pleasure too. Thank you.